Hi everyone, I'm Vasil. I'm a senior software engineer at Workday. I'm working in a um, storage um, platform uh, team and uh, working on the uh, OSF solutions uh, in the, uh, our data centers. Uh, so uh, in Workday, we take a lot of pride in uh, actual customer sat satisfaction. Uh, it's a leading enterprise cloud for finance and HR. Uh, so uh, we're trying to keep uh, uh, our customers happy. And as part of that, uh, we as infrastructure that provides uh, storage, we know for sure that uh, uh, no, uh, our direct customers, which is development teams, uh, no um, worthy customers wants to lose any kind of data. So it's vital to uh, keep it uh, working at all cost. Uh, we're quite a small team uh, of five engineers. We also have uh, uh, one Red Hat uh, consultant uh, working with us. And we're working not only on Ceph, we also have, uh, uh, I think, about three uh, other projects uh, that we're maintaining and uh, developing as um, aside of this. And uh, we have to work with, uh, we have five different data centers. Uh, we have uh, already uh, 23 clusters uh, across them uh, with t uh, more than 1,200 servers and uh, almost 100 petabyte raw capacity across all of them. Um, this goes along with uh, major use cases. Uh, we are uh, storing uh, um, images for OpenStack uh, in uh, our clusters, and we have to serve all the um, requests for image downloads in less than two minutes. Uh, otherwise, some uh, um, orchestration tools uh, that we have uh, internally they won't uh, uh, work and will fail uh, provisioning of the VM. And that um, the nature of uh, Workday updates is that you have to do more than 12,000 uh, downloads or image um, VM provisionings in a matter of uh, just few hours uh, when there is a downtime to the system. Um, and aside of that, we have uh, also uh, already a working solution for MySQL backups. Uh, where we moved from NFS into the uh, self storage. Uh, we're currently using block devices for that. And it improved uh, a side of resilience that we can lose uh, um, some uh, servers on our side, and we still have all the backups uh, available. Uh, we improved uh, a lot uh, uh, time it takes uh, for the backups uh, to from uh, um, over 24 hours to just seven hours. And we serving about uh, almost two petabytes of uh, writes in during these backups happening because they also happen all at once. So uh, before we go into um, why we decided to, uh, to go with multiple clusters, I uh, need to give some uh, context. So first of all, uh, we wanted to have a um, very specific uh, uh, scenario where we can control that we update only one cluster and not all of them. Because even with uh, uh, well-tested uh, updates, uh, you might impact some functionality uh, from the storage system, and you want to reduce blast radios as much as possible. So that's why we have uh, uh, gone with uh, separate clusters for each environment, and Further to that, uh, we're also providing uh, clusters as needed. Uh, so if we need more performant cluster, we might not uh, put it uh, beside the uh, archive SKU and uh, have them mixed together so that we separate the workloads uh, uh, better and can tweak them appropriately uh, for the needs. Another thing is uh, we uh, did go ahead with uh, uh, Red Hat commercial support uh, this uh, actually came in clutch uh, um, when we had an issue with uh, kernel bug, and uh, uh, that uh, issue on the client side was causing MySQL servers to restart randomly, and uh, for some time we couldn't figure out uh, what was happening, because at that time uh, 
Ceph volumes were mounted, but not actually even in use. So no one was writing or reading from them at that time. And um, another part is that uh, we do have the um, single control point for all the clusters. So we uh, sent all the metrics into uh, same system and uh, logging solution for metrics and logs. And we um, leveraging that to compare different clusters, like if you have uh, clusters that should be um, about the same performance, but you see that one cluster is underperforming, you can compare by metrics and see what's different in the pattern of uh, how you use it. And as I said, we do provide different clusters. So we currently have uh, um, two set of clusters uh, different. Um, I go slightly deeper into that uh, soon. And if we need very specific use case uh, going forward, uh, we um, decide whether we want to expand existing cluster with uh, more use cases or if we need a, a specific hardware for that particular needs. So um, as you can see, we have uh, a number of clusters uh, uh, across the world. Uh, there is always a uh, problem with uh, that you uh, need uh, some kind of replication, uh, distributing data from one site to another. Uh, for disaster recovery or other needs. And um, uh, you have to overcome uh, problems of uh, latency and so on when you're uh, copying data from one place uh, to another. And um, as I said, we have uh, currently uh, up and running two different set of uh, um, SKUs, uh, so setups for clusters. First one is uh, everywhere, uh, standard clusters. That's uh, the one that we went uh, with first. And originally we started with uh, um, quite small size, uh, just eight servers, um, each of them about uh, 32 terabytes uh, of storage. So um, somewhere around 300 terabytes in a cluster and uh, using tree repli uh, replica tree um, crash map and um, relying on having two servers in a rock so that even if one of our rocks dies, we still can recover data and uh, we resilient on multiple levels, not just one drive dies, uh, but uh, one server or even a rock. Uh, that was in 2020. Uh, in uh, uh, 2021, we started with uh, uh, developing solution for MySQL backups. They are much larger uh, fleet. And uh, uh, in 2022, we uh, pretty much completed uh, only a few sites were, uh, were left. And um, uh, we uh, configured the setup that uh, uh, while for standard usage, you might want to use S3 and uh, RBD um, in different uh, ways and you don't really know whether uh, someone needs more performance or someone needs more space or what will be the use pattern. For high density, we went with archive um, in, uh, in mind so that you write once and then maybe you will read it, uh, maybe not. So uh, we went with uh, 10 servers in a rock. It is a risk because if you lose a whole rock, that's uh, um, a lot of data. Um, with each server being a lot uh, beefier and with lots of HDDs, uh, about uh, 80 or 90 uh, terabytes in a single host. So uh, that scales uh, uh, with 10 servers um, by a margin. And if you lose that uh, amount of data, you need to re, uh, rebuild it uh, from scratch. And on top of that, to reduce cost on storing the archive data, we went with erasure coding, which is uh, at cost of uh, 1.5 uh, times of uh, storage uh, capacity, you actually get uh, resilience of um, same as replica tree. So even if you uh, lose one rock uh, in this case, you still can recover all the data. But at this scale, um, keep in mind that uh, recovering and rebalancing uh, with erasure coding, it needs to recalculate everything so uh, it takes really long time. Um, 
So how did we uh, got here? Um, as you can see, I'm not sure um, it's slightly small numbers, but uh, so in uh, um, 2020, we went with uh, 13 clusters. That's already a quite big number of clusters, but they were quite small and uh, fairly easy to manage. Uh, and uh, with each year, uh, we were increasing the number of clusters uh, because we uh, needed so. We probably will um, increase it uh, even more uh, with new use cases uh, that we're currently looking into. And uh, as you can see, the number of servers uh, went from uh, uh, just below 100 uh, the first uh, um, uh, chart, uh, column on a chart, uh, to over 1,300 uh, hosts by now. And that's because of uh, how we're growing uh, our um, uh, standard SKUs. Uh, we need to keep up with uh, the needs uh, uh, for existing customers. And uh, as I mentioned, in 2021, we started looking into uh, archive SKU, which was a lot of servers uh, at once. Uh, the number of drives uh, went up uh, drastically. Uh, so by now we have almost 20,000 uh, uh, drives and most of them are HDD spinners. Um, and so uh, capacity went uh, up to um, 100 petabytes. Uh, with such rapid growth, um, there is some toll. Uh, so if you look at uh, vendor-provided uh, uh, details on how often drives failing in a month, um, even though the numbers there, um, <coughs> 0 0.045 or 0 0.007%, uh, percent, it's really, really small number, it's still with uh, uh, a lot of drives comes into, why well, at the beginning we could uh, have one drive failing uh, from one to five months, uh, which is very easy to manage manually, uh, to uh, from three to 16 failures every month. So that's pretty much uh, every um, third day you have um, a failure uh, on a drive. And if you need to do that uh, manually replacing uh, drives, uh, manually reconfiguring them uh, as OSDs uh, do not reconfigure automatically currently uh, for us, um, we required some automation around that, and also you need to make sure that uh, all the clusters are around the same configuration uh, altogether. So that's why we started with uh, continuous del delivery. Um, I know that uh, um, in Bloomberg they uh, also uh, implemented already uh, continuous delivery um, and integration. We have this uh, also running for a few years already, uh, not really an option to uh, open source it because it's uh, mostly using uh, tools that are internal and uh, they don't uh, apply uh, um, gener in general to uh, everyone. But the principles uh, pretty much the same um, how you could do that uh, as well. Uh, so what we have right now is we have two different uh, uh, set of clusters. Uh, standard clusters and high density clusters, all of them running uh, still Nautilus, unfortunately, and uh, they running different uh, operating system. So standard clusters are still running on Rails 7, uh, while uh, uh, new clusters uh, um, high density on Rails 8. And um, um, they all containerized, uh, and if you have been running uh, Rail 7 or 8 with Ceph Ansible, uh, you would know that um, uh, the um, engine for containers is different. On 7, it's Docker. On um, 8, it's Podman. Um, and for uh, continuous delivery, as I mentioned, every single change, we need to make sure that it's uh, well, well validated, that it will work on our uh, setups. And uh, it starts with uh, uh, testing actually everything on the OpenStack VMs. We spin a bunch of VMs, attach uh, volumes to them, and uh, deploy Ceph the same way how we would deploy it uh, um, on the bare metal systems. 
After that, it goes into bare metal CI cluster, which is a static cluster on bare metal servers, uh, which we continuously uh, deploy every single change. Um, so we can uh, make sure that it's not only for new clusters works uh, the next change, but also works uh, during the upgrading things. Um, after that, it goes into semi-production. So uh, we call it DevProd. Uh, it's production for us because a lot of developers are actually using and relying on the, um, our storage for their own testing. And uh, specifically for OpenStack, that's where we would uh, build images and uh, distribute from. So we need to make sure that it's always up and running and uh, safe. And uh, this is a first stop for um, if we in encounter any bugs with uh, Ceph or upgrade procedures or anything else with configuration, some degradation, we wouldn't be pushing into production clusters where actual customers' uh, workloads running and um, where we could uh, have some actual impact to workday itself. Um, another part, uh, when you have a lot of clusters and uh, um, a large fleet is customers onboarding. So when you have a single cluster, it's not that um, um, hard for an uh, engineer or admin to go and provision keys, provision um, Rados Gateway user or something and uh, send that over some uh, secure mechanisms uh, to users. Um, even with that, our security was not happy to have uh, uh, an admin actually see the keys and then deliver to customers. So we had to come up with uh, an option to send these keys uh, securely without even seeing ourselves. I know that everything in uh, Ceph you can uh, look through uh, with Ceph commands, but when you're onboarding, you don't really need to know what keys were provisioned for a customer. Uh, so we uh, went with some kind of uh, uh, self-onboarding uh, system. Um, first, explaining uh, who are using uh, Ceph currently. Uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, use cases for standard clusters, as I mentioned before, is uh, private cloud image storage. And that means that every single uh, hypervisor needs to download at some point uh, an image, and it has to have some Ceph keys uh, to be able to do that. And to reduce blast radios if uh, those keys are stolen or anything, we went with a separate set of Ceph keys, Rados gateway keys, everything uh, for each host. And that's with uh, thousands of hosts, so it's uh, impossible for a human to actually provision that uh, manually. For high density clusters, mostly it's MySQL backups. So there is not that many uh, servers, but we still need an automated solution so that when uh, uh, MySQL team have new servers uh, uh, coming uh, into their fleet, they can uh, automatically get new keys without uh, requesting anything from us on that side. And for the future use case, we're looking into OpenStack uh, persistent storage so that um, uh, we would have uh, Cinder backed with uh, uh, Ceph and uh, having the, um, for the most demanding use cases uh, who need uh, actually running OpenStack VMs and have storage uh, uh, in it uh, to have something available uh, to them, which is much different use case from uh, other ones, uh, it's not read once and uh, ne um, sorry, write once and never read. Uh, it's also not a usual case because you actually need a lot of IOPS or depending on what needs of the customer running that VM. Um, so the self-service uh, that I mentioned, uh, in general, it's uh, an Ansible playbook that we uh, run manually when we have a new use case. Um, our um, customers receive automated notification uh, with uh, a first uh, key that they can enter Secret Manager. And then through Secret Manager, they can request as many uh, Ceph or Rados Gateway users as they need. 
So they can request uh, one per server, they can request 10 per server if they desire so. And um, um, with this automation, we actually were able to um, ensure uh, security requirements that uh, even if uh, a key is uh, stolen, we can, through the same se uh, secret manager, we can revoke the key and uh, um, without any downtime or anything, rotate uh, to get a new one. So uh, going into what lessons we learned during all this journey. Um, first of all, uh, always need to build automation uh, first, because if you start with mono deployment of a few clusters and then tweaking them and then afterwards uh, trying to uh, add automation on top, you will start from a different stage for each cluster. Uh, you might have uh, the same uh, uh, setup, but in most cases, when you do something manually, it's always different uh, uh, for different places. Um, also, community is very important. We were com contributing to community uh, for changes that uh, we needed, uh, but uh, we also thought that uh, community will um, have benefit from it. Um, like, for example, uh, we needed uh, uh, S3 to support uh, our secret manager, uh, which is Vote um, as KMS. Uh, so we did contribute to Rados Gateway so that it natively supports. We don't need to have some uh, internally uh, hidden version of Rados Gateway that uh, adds that support or anything. And along with that, we uh, get a benefit of actually having um, an option to discuss with the community uh, to see whether it's a good idea or not, whether someone else uh, wants uh, the same feature and so on. Also, if you grow really fast, uh, it uh, can become a burden at some point if you have too many uh, uh, growth and you didn't keep up with uh, automation for that. Um, and apart from that, uh, I can say for sure that uh, uh, it's quite hard to keep upgrading at the speed of uh, community releases um, when you have a lot of clusters that actually serve some customer traffic and uh, hold the data for customers that you cannot lose at all. And there are some pros and cons of isolating your environments uh, uh, physically as different clusters. Um, Yes, as a pro, uh, the failure can be um, located in a single cluster, so you don't impact users from a different data center, from a different environment, uh, um, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, it uh, impacts developers. You might not have enough time to work on uh, making sure that uh, all the automation is uh, um, up to date and that you uh, have tested everything uh, uh, properly if you are uh, having a lot of different clusters and you need to update them one by one uh, separately. Um, as for next challenges, um, I was presenting this uh, uh, also on set days and uh, it remains pretty much uh, uh, the same. We still need to upgrade to Ceph 5, even though there is Ceph 6 already uh, available uh, from Red Hat. Uh, so we running on Ceph 4, which is Nautilus, 5 is uh, Pacific, and um, we do want to upgrade to that, but we had an issue with uh, S3 policies where we thought that it's actually a bug in Rados Gateway, and we were waiting, um, expecting that bug to be fixed uh, uh, pretty soon. So uh, once we uptake, uh, uh, uptook the uh, fix, we realized that it was not actually a bug in the S3 itself, it was a user mistake, but Ceph was allowing that mistake. So we had a wrong policies in the S3 and uh, they were preventing uh, to access those buckets because with newer version, Ceph was actually validating properly the policies and that was breaking the logic that was working before. So that started uh, our uh, upgrade process uh, quite a bit. And uh, due to security, we're still uh, struggling to uptake uh, Ceph ADM. Um, it's good too. It automates a lot of things uh, that uh, we're struggling with. Those who have been running Ceph Ansible know how slow it is. Uh, it actually goes through a lot of hopes to 
figure out what state you are in right now and whether you need any changes or not. And when you have clusters with hundreds of uh, servers, it will be um, for a simple change to just monitor config in self config file, it will go restarting all the services across the whole cluster. Um, apart from that, um, we still uh, looking into cross-site uh, replication. We do have uh, some parts in place already, uh, but it's also a big change uh, in mind for the users if they need to change from uh, usual idea of uh, you have a local storage or NFS system where you write data, you have just one server, and then you, uh, with your application, replicate somewhere else and uh, write data there as well. In uh, our case, we do want to have replication uh, for disaster recoveries done automatically by Ceph itself, so users don't need to duplicate the data, have uh, um, extra load on their side for this, and uh, it actually should be provided from the storage system itself. Um, so we do have multiple uh, ways to uh, implement that. Uh, mainly, it's started behind upgrading to uh, Pacific, uh, which has much more granular uh, replication for S3. And um, the last but not least, um, we're still uh, looking into implementing more automation, more monitoring for that, and so on, and uh, using uh, more newer tools uh, to make sure that clusters are well balanced and such. And um, along with that, we already have uh, a lot of improvements uh, uh, since last time. Uh, we can have uh, uh, disks replaced without uh, us uh, um, doing uh, much work. So uh, everything is automated uh, uh, to the stage where you can um, DC um, people will uh, replace the disk and uh, we just run a playbook that uh, reconfigures everything. And uh, we also detect the failures. So, uh, currently, we have an effort that will uh, remove us from the picture there at all, so we don't need to run the playbook. Uh, it will be done automatically. Um, so that's pretty much all uh, from me. If any questions, happy to answer. Uh, hi, uh, I just want to know your viewpoint. I said that you you pretty much emphasize on Ceph ADM for your deployment that you guys are looking for. We are in a similar boat where we still use Ansible, but we want uh, Ceph ADM currently doesn't support like a, it's just container based. It does not support the uh, bare metal. So you said for your high density clusters you have beefier machines. Would you still prefer using Ceph ADM container on those on those machines, or did have you all thought about it? Uh, yeah, so we already have uh, um, containerized all the solutions. Uh, so they all running uh, services containerized. Uh, and uh, yes, there is a toll of uh, uh, is being another layer of uh, indirection and so on. But it helps uh, with uh, doing the upgrades, especially when you have a large fleet of 200 uh, servers and you need to update to a new version. Mm -hmm. um, actually having a container is much easier to do because you, sh uh, you pull a new container and then just in a few seconds you shut down an uh, existing one and spin up uh, a new one. So it's much easier to uh, do the, um, what would be previously a really expensive operation where you uh, have to go through every host, upgrade RPMs there and so on. So primary pain point is the upgrade is what kind of drives you to use the container, right? Um, not only that, uh, another part is that uh, it's a, a preferred solution from, um, so in community, uh, Ceph Ansible is getting uh, phased out. Uh, so most people are looking into containers and also Red Hat supports mostly uh, now Ceph ADM. So it, plus I had a uh, play with uh, Ceph ADM itself. It has a lot of features built in so you don't need to gather information from the cluster. It already have that information. And a lot of uh, uh, things are kind of becoming native.
Silencio. Uh, I was just curious uh, for your high density uh, solution. You said you could lose an entire rack with the ratio coding. So what profile are you running then? Uh, so we're running K2M4. Uh, um, so technically, you can lose two rocks, and you still have four pieces of data out of six. Uh, but there is actually an interesting uh, um, issue in uh, Nautilus itself that uh, when you lose uh, two pieces of uh, data, it doesn't go into repairing uh, the PG. It uh, um, be being a bit more cautious uh, because it doesn't have enough uh, um, parts of the data, even though uh, losing two is uh, still good enough. Um, there is a workaround that you actually modify to allow uh, lower mean size uh, on that pool. Uh, then it will uh, repair it uh, just fine. Uh, but in newer versions, I think uh, starting from Pacific, uh, it's already uh, implemented. It's actually just a change in the code that was looking for n plus one uh, parts uh, instead of n. Thank you. Do you have a sense of how much time it takes to rebuild from a failed uh, So. So far, we haven't lost uh, a whole uh, rock. Uh, in general, if we need to uh, make some changes uh, to a rock networking or something, uh, it's cheaper to actually um, wait for the rock to be uh, brought in. And that's actually uh, the default uh, behavior of uh, Ceph as well. It's not like we losing a disk where it's uh, right away starts uh, uh, rebalancing data. Uh, it will wait uh, for you to actually tear it uh, to start rebalancing, but because you know that um, moving about petabyte of data is not that uh, cheap. And with erasure coding, uh, we know for sure that when we do expansions, uh, they take uh, up to a week uh, for adding uh, uh, about 20 hosts to um, 100 or 200 hosts, uh, because uh, um, when you're uh, moving erasure-coded PGs, it needs to recalculate all the pieces of data and shuffle them around um, in a new way. And recalculation actually takes uh, a lot of time for that. Cool. Thank you all.